Hello students, welcome back. We are going to go into the second part of this unit and the topic here is molecular compounds. Molecular compounds are composed of two or more different non-metals. Now unlike the polyatomic ions that we talked about in the first part, a molecular compound doesn't have an overall charge. They exist as discrete units with specific numbers of atoms unlike ionic compounds, which exist as a multiple three-dimensional array of ions, the number of which depends on the size of the sample. In the case of a molecular compound, the electrons are not transferred. In other words, you don't have an atom with less electrons than one with more electrons, in other words, with a positive and negative charge. In this case, electrons are shared between the atoms. We're going to call that type of a link a covalent bond, and we'll study these in more detail later in the semester. Let's look at what the formulas tell us about compounds. Consider the first one here, NaCl. We know that NaCl is an ionic compound. One of the component elements, sodium, is a metal. So that's kind of like a giveaway. Remember that an ionic compound's formula expresses simply the ratio of the ions in the simplest possible numbers. The actual number of atoms will depend on the size of the sample since the compound exists as a three-dimensional lattice or array of multiple, multiple ions. In contrast, look at CO2. CO2 is a molecular compound. There are no metal elements in this compound, and any sample of CO2 will consist of molecules that consist each one of a carbon and two oxygens. Now, a special case here in terms of molecules is what we see here on the bottom, O2. This is what we mean when we say oxygen. It's actually the diatomic molecule of oxygen that exists uh, naturally. We call this a molecular element. Oxygen is not unique in this. If we look at the next slide here, we can see on this periodic table that there are a set of elements that exist in nature as diatomic molecules. They are highlighted in yellow here, H, N, O, F, C, L, B, R, and I. There are other ones that exist as polyatomic molecules, but let's not be concerned with those for now. What is important right now is that we memorize, that we remember which are these seven elements that exist in nature as diatomic molecules. So going forward, when we're talking about chemical reactions or physical processes or whatever that involve these elements, when we say the name of the element, Unless we specifically inform that we're talking about single atoms, the name of the element is to be understood as the diatomic molecule. So if I say an expression like, for example, combustion involves a reaction with oxygen. When I say that with no other explanation, it is to be understood that I mean O2 when I say oxygen. Okay, so please memorize these uh, seven elements and uh, going forward i'll hope that you will remember them okay all right let's move forward so ionic and molecular compounds besides their composition uh, and their formulas they have different properties some of these are listed here but some of the things that are mentioned here are properties that we haven't discussed yet so for the moment being let me focus on just one thing and it is that if you identify a compound, either from its name or from its formula, as an ionic compound, that compound in its natural form is going to be a crystalline solid. So in the absence of any other information or under conditions that are not extreme, if we are mentioning an ionic compound, we are going to assume that it's a crystalline solid. Molecular compounds, on the other hand, can come in different physical states. Some of them are going to be gases. Some of them are going to be liquids. Some of them are going to be solid. Those that are solid, typically, not always, but typically, will be soft, like powdery type of solids. And the other properties, you can look at them. But at this point, 
Uh, they're a little beyond the scope of the discussion when I have, but you can read in your textbook for some uh, examples of these. Okay, so let's do this exercise here. I'm going to show you four formulas here, and I want you to identify each compound as being ionic or molecular. Remember, our strategy is to identify if there is a metal involved in here. If there is a metal element, then we're going to label it as ionic. And if there aren't any metal elements involved, then we'll label it as molecular. Okay, let me give a few seconds to look at these four formulas and let me see what you come up with. Okay, CCl4, what would that be? Very good, it's molecular. Both elements C and Cl, carbon and chlorine, are non metals. Next one, CaF2. Very good, and you should know the name of that, right? Calcium fluoride. That is ionic because calcium, one of the elements, is a metal. SF6. Excellent. Molecular because both elements, sulfur and fluorine, are non metals. Next one, CuCO3. Okay, careful with this one. Ah, very good. Even though C and O are non-metals, they are present here in the form of a polyatomic ion. How do we know? Well, because one of the elements here is copper, which is a metal. That means the compound is ionic, and therefore that CO3 portion there is a polyatomic ion. Okay. Now let's talk about nomenclature. How do we name and write the formulas for molecular compounds? Well, one of the interesting things is that because molecular compounds do not consist of ions, the nonmetals that compose them are in ratios that are difficult to predict. The main reason is also that there are sometimes different compounds composed of the same elements, but just in different ratios or different numbers of atoms per molecule. So, for example, carbon and oxygen. We already saw CO2, but there is another compound that is CO. So that means that in this case, the actual formula is very important. How about sulfur and oxygen? You have SO2 and you have SO3. Nitrogen and oxygen are notorious because they can form many different compounds with many different numbers of nitrogen and oxygen atoms, and you can see six of them in here in this list. So when we name a molecular compound, therefore, we have to indicate uh, in the name how many units of each element are in there. Now, there are many different kinds of molecular compounds. Some of them are composed of two, three, maybe four different uh, elements. So we're going to focus our nomenclature here into just what we call binary molecular compounds. A binary compound is a compound that contains atoms or ions of only two elements. Notice that to say that a compound is binary simply says there's only two elements involved. So an ionic compound like sodium chloride could be considered binary because there's only two elements involved. But we're going to focus here on molecular compounds. Let's say that I have a molecular compound formula in front of me. So I have two elements in there for a binary compound. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna name the leftmost element, you know, the first one going from left to right, the same way that I would name a main group metal. Remember when we did the ions, when it was sodium, we call it sodium. When it was uh, calcium, we call it sap calcium. We're going to apply the same rule here. In other words, we're just going to use whatever the name of the element is on the periodic table. Okay, so if it's nitrogen, it's nitrogen. Okay, if it's uh, uh, chlorine, it's chlorine. Now, the second element, the rightmost one, we're going to change its ending to an IDE form. Yes. It makes it sound as if it were a monoatomic anion, but uh, it's not an uh, anion. We know that already, but we're going to use this form just to help us name the compound. Now, remember, in ionic compounds, because the charges of the ions ultimately determine the ratios of them, 
we didn't have to indicate how many units of each were. In other words, the name of the compound did not have to indicate the ratios of each ion. But in the case of binary molecular compounds, because we have the possibilities of having multiple compounds between the same two elements, we're going to have to indicate how many atoms of each there are. And to do that, we're going to use Greek prefixes to denote the number of atoms of each element. So I'm going to have you memorize just the first 10. Mono for 1, di for 2, tri for 3, tetra for 4, penta for 5, like you know the Pentagon, right, in Washington, D.C., hexa for 6, hepta for 7, octa for 8, like the octagon in mixed martial arts, nona for 9, and deca for 10. Uh, you don't have to memorize anything beyond that, okay? We're not going to give you compounds with more than that. Now, one important thing here is the use of mono. You're not going to use the mono prefix for the first element. In other words, if the first element in the compounds formula only has one atom, we're not going to use mono for that particular element. Okay? The other thing is, the mono is going to be used for the second element in the formula if, if, we know that those two elements can form other types of compounds. So let me tell you what I mean by that. What I mean by that is that, for example, the compound HCl only has one H and one chlorine. So technically, we would use the, the name hydrogen monochloride. But because we know that H and Cl do not form other compounds, Chemists will sometimes just simply say uh, hydrogen chloride. And of course, hydrogen chloride is a gas that when you dissolve it in water, forms a solution. And in that case, we call the compound hydrochloric acid. We'll talk more about acids in our lab activity later on. Okay. I'm sorry for the bad handwriting here. I'm really terrible at writing on these uh, whiteboards and these screens here. Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to give a little practice here. This will be a very short lesson here, so let's practice with the binary molecules. Okay, let me have you say what is the name of each one of these compounds here. Remember, the first thing that we see here, yes, they told us each binary molecule, so it gives away that these are molecular compounds, but I could have simply said each binary compound and have you go through the exercise mentally or determine determining, oh, is this an ionic or is this a molecular compound? Which is actually what you're going to be doing in your lab activity of this week, which we call experiment N uh, for nomenclature. You're going to have several worksheets where you're going to practice writing formulas and giving names of different kinds of compounds. Okay, you got the first one here? Very good. Silicon tetrabromide. Very good. Tetra for four. The first one, the first element, we don't have to put mono because it's the first element. There's only one. How about P2O3? I know you're probably going to say, you know, something, something, but it is diphosphorus trioxide. Diphosphorus trioxide. Next one. Tick tock, tick tock. Here we go. Sulfur hexafluoride. Don't confuse hexa, which is for six, and hepta, which is for seven. Okay? So hopefully I guess you know practice. This is not something new for most of you. You've all done this before in your introductory chemistry courses. So as a matter of fa fact, most of the stuff that we've discussed so far, you've probably seen before. So hopefully it's a good refresher, a good review. Um, now, there are some compounds that are so common that we do not bother giving them these formal names, okay? So for example, water, H2O, we don't bother giving it a formula name. Ammonia, NH3, hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. These are compounds that we name them for their common names. We don't use the systematic naming formats that we just discussed here, okay? And on that note, let's go take a little break here. 
and have some fun. ...of how receptive people can be to fear-mongering. Can I get you guys to sign a petition? Are you what here? for? For uh, banning dihydrogen monoxide. Oh yeah, I'll start there. Thank you very much. Our petition woman was getting signatures left and right. We're talking hundreds. It causes a lot of urination, um, vomiting. Yeah, I'm can familiar even cause... with it. Oh, okay. That's dye, hydrogen, monoxide, water. Uh, this is a petition for dihydrogen monoxide. What it is is it's a chemical that is found now in reservoirs and in lakes. Pesticides, different kind of companies are using this. And she's not going to lie or even stretch the truth. Not at all. She's just going to talk about what water is and what it does with the vocabulary and tone of environmental hysteria. It's styrofoam companies, nuclear, nuclear companies. And now when they use it in pesticides, when we're washing our fruit and things like that, it's not coming out. It causes excessive sweating, excessive urination. And it's in the grocery stores and in our baby's food and stuff like that. We don't know if they thought, but they signed. There we are. Okay, students, I hope you enjoyed that. You had some fun. We're going to wrap it up here. This is part two of our uh, third unit. And in the next part, we're going to talk about, well, how did we arrive at these formulas? In other words, yeah, it's one thing to be given a name or a formula on a piece of paper. It's another one to be given a sample of a compound and try to determine what is it and what is its formula. And that'll be the subject of the next part of our lecture. Thank you very much.